So welcome to LASER, Leonardo Art and Science, Evening Rendezvous Talk St. Petersburg. Today discussion, safe and resound, preserving and archiving, sound art and experimental music. The Leonardo Lasers are program for the international gathering of artists, scientists with the wider public. The mission of LASER is to encourage contribution to the cultural environment of the region. Leonardo was founded in 2008 by Leonardo International Society of Art and Science. And today they have 47 sites worldwide. Today's conversation, Safe and Resound, focuses on preserving and archiving sound art and experimental music. How are archiving efforts and the restoration evolved for sound art, the contemporary experimental music and intermediate works, reel to reel tape, eight track cassettes, DATs, and many different file types. What are the main challenges for archiving and preservation process? What is the role and challenges of emerging technologies. Today's sound art and digital media are extremely hybrid. What are innovative approaches and creative production technique to resound the works in which a major component is sound? From media players, directional sound uh, sources, lounges for uh, listening or combination. Our first speaker, Jonathan Heim is curator of Rogers and Hammerstein archives of recorded sound in New York Public Library for the Performing Arts. He specializes in American music and recorded sound with the particular emphasis on the 20th century music. He oversees one of the world's largest sound archives. As well, he curates uh, the extensive American collection and help and assist researchers. He holds MA in music and history and um, in history and literature from Boston University and PhD in musicology from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Tell us about yourself, your research interest and the New York Public, Public Library Archive of Recorded Sound. Jonathan? Well, thank you, Natalia, and good evening, I think, to most of you from New York, where I'm sitting. I hope you're all well. Um, so as Natalia mentioned, I am uh, the curator. My full title is Curator of Music and Recorded Sound at the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts, um, which is a part of the New York Public Library system, which is uh, focused on free and open access to information and resources to the public. We are comprised of 90 locations that lend books in a traditional li lending library fashion. And we also have three major research centers of which the Performing Arts Library is one. Um, our library is located on the campus of Lincoln Center. So we are next to the Metropolitan Opera House and uh, we enjoy, um, in, in as much as we enjoy regular library patrons, we're very grateful for all of the uh, friends that come from Lincoln Center and from around the world to come visit us. So I, I've been asked here today, I think in part, because uh, the collection I oversee at the New York Public Library is vast and it's old, uh, but a particular strength of our collections have been in Amer the American experimental tradition. And this in our in our collections, this dates back, uh, you know, it, it maybe about 1930, where there was a commitment by the music division to collect uh, American music, which, as you know, even at this time, um, in the classical tradition wasn't uh, was still something that was struggling to form itself. Uh, so that being said, we have also welcomed and, and uh, 
collected the tradition of American music that is and is experimental in a variety of ways. Some of the composers, for example, you may have heard of um, Henry Cowell is a major figure whose archive we we take care of. George Antile, who you may have heard of for his his work with um, you know all kinds of machine types of music, and of course his very famous spouse Hedy Lamarr. Um, also, um, more recently, um, the music manuscripts of John Cage and many of the uh, musicians and performers and composers and technologists uh, who who were associated with him and his work and and vice versa. Those are types of collections we we work with as well. Um, uh, beyond that, we continue to collect <clears throat> actively in this area. And I want to say as the 1980s, uh, one of my predecessors made a, de a deliberate um, effort to create a, uh, a collecting policy around electroacoustic music in particular. And well, so we began collecting that. So this may, the, and I'll give you some of this background because I think it may inflect this wider discussion, but um, that collection was given to the music or developed by the music division, but in some ways has only recently uh, been something we've been able to embrace and present to the public, primarily because of the uh, nature of the technological elements in these archives. So, for example, a major um, archive we have is that of Eric Sade, who, while made a big name in the uh, industrial side of sound, uh, um, his his collection and his ideas inform a lot of those who came after him. We were able to get Eric today's collection and and have the dats preserved uh, and keep it around. But then we weren't able really to serve it as well as we'd like because people weren't sure how to access some of the more um, abstract materials used for sound sources and things like that. So those are some of the things that I think we'll come back to uh, when we're talking about this. Um, but those, um, these are, you know, it's just an important area for us to collect, but it's an important area for us to work with the public, both locally and around the world, to find out how to best situate the materials to be useful to researchers uh, first and foremost, but also to those who simply uh, would like to enjoy it. How can we make these materials available in a meaningful way to people, um, both uh, as, as a performative event in some cases, and then as a set of materials that whose legacy is left for study. So um, I don't want to take too much more time yakking. I did want to say, though, as a way of, of segue, um, an era, a collection or a pair of collections we've been eagerly working on. And uh, because we're an institution, we're sort of slow and there's a pandemic, but we're looking forward to working with Phil uh, Niblock and Experimental Intermedia in bringing those archives to the New York Public Library uh, where we can keep them safe and sound and make them available to people. So maybe that's a good way to hand it off. Thank you so much, Zonton. Our next speaker is Catherine Liberovska. She is a Canadian intermediate artist who is based in New York City. She has been involved in experimental videos since 1980s. She has produced numerous single channel video artworks, video installations, and video performances as well. And she works in other media. She has been shown around the world. And since 2001, who works predominantly focuses on intersection of moving image and sound. She collaborated with different composers and sound artists. In addition to her artworks, she also curated many exhibitions in experimental video, film, sound, audio and video performances, including screen compositions and optosonic tea. In 2014, she completed her PhD in the University of Quebec in Montreal. Catherine, please tell us about yourself, your artistic search and research interest. Uh, Catherine? Sound? 
sorry, I was muted. Um, um, for myself, I'm, I've been working um, predominantly in, in the broader world of video art since the late 80s, originally coming from painting, but of course, uh, from the very beginning, sound was always part of my practice, and I worked um, either with many composers or or even uh, producing sound myself um, in different ways. I'm not a composer or a musician, but um, many soundtracks I've made for video works have been based on field recordings um, and different kind of um, sound making uh, possibilities. And um, <clears throat> so interestingly, uh, yeah, so um, as for video with, within this um, discussion, it's, it's interesting that, that um, uh, I mean, audio, that audio within the field of, of, of video is a, a completely different um, problematic than than in in the field of, of music and audio because um, in in the field of archiving video and film uh, often um, people uh, it, it it's um, sorry. Uh, audio is 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 preserved in, in uh, uh, with less quality um, because a, a lot of the formats in 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 which um, audio or film is preserved um, has it, it is played back on devices of lower quality. So so I was just uh, telling the other panelists when when we gathered. Um, just before the discussion started that that um, interestingly uh, even from the very beginning when I started working with audio in in video and and um, back in the 80s um, vi the video editing was done in studios with ABC role and and then you and then you would add the the the, the audio and um, you always worked with like really bad speakers because because a, a lot of the video uh, would be viewed on on very bad home television sets. So you you always had to mix down to uh, not not too many highs or lows to, to make sure that it's um, that that it's it's here and 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 still today like if if you're mixing sound for for Vimeo or YouTube. Uh, for people to watch on their laptops or home computers, that, that's a particular problem. Uh, but anyway, and for myself, I also work a lot with visuals, uh, live visuals in, 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 in the area of um, uh, live performance with music. So uh, actually my PhD thesis was called um, Improvisatory Live Visuals Playing Images Like a Musical Instrument. So um, I'm, I'm constantly collaborating with uh, composers and musicians um, in improvisatory or structured works and also collaborating with composers and musicians and sound artists uh, for installation works. Um, however, I'm also here to speak um, about experimental intermedia and also about Phil Nibelog who un unfortunately couldn't join us today. And um, so um, Phil, uh, for his part, um, he began composing in, in the um, uh, late 60s, early 70s. And uh, he's had, um, like many composers of, of his age or who started in the 60s or 70s, a, a whole trajectory of um, different formats he worked with. So, so he started with, um, uh, stereo analog tape and, and then uh, soon moved to uh, four track and, and eight track tape um, for composing works, but then um, mixing that down to stereo for performance and, and for preservation. And, and then he also used cassettes with famous 
with the famous Sony Walkmans for recordings of, especially field recordings and also DATs for field recordings. And in 1998, um, he started working with Pro Tools. And so then he, he would um, record and uh, do the multi-track mix uh, all directly uh, digitally in, in Pro Tools. But um, uh, from the very beginning, he always worked with audio engineers and, 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 and his music is made, so this is specifically the music, uh, from mono uh, recordings that are then multi-tracked and, 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 and mixed uh, in different uh, with different levels and um, mixes. And as for um, experimental intermedia, um, so concerts began in 1973, but it wasn't until 1979 that uh, all concerts at experimental intermedia were systematically recorded. Uh, until then, there were like some sporadic, uh, or I think if someone requested uh, to record a concert, that was done. And then in 1979, um, the recording began in quarter inch stereo, and uh, very soon they uh, began uh, simultaneously recording. Reco recording, a, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody talking in my answer, answering machine very loudly, uh, speaking of sound. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so, so the documentation for many years was on uh, quarter inch stereo and yeah, and simultaneously they, they, they would record just a, a, a plain audio cassette as documentation for uh, the artists and performers. And then in 1988, uh, everything began to be um, recorded on DAT. And uh, sometime around 2010, uh, the, the documentation moved to um, SD cards and well, in any case, like purely digital. And also sometime in the nineties, there began to be systematic video uh, documentation of all the concerts, but usually just a straightforward camera, uh, just a still camera recording the concerts. So, um, so something that probably what we will be talking about in the discussion is 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 the challenges of all these different of all these different um, formats and 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 um, ways of working and uh, and also yeah so um, and I know for, for Phil. Um, that uh, in part, like in terms of archiving, you know, difficulties are uh, um, aspects that uh, Jonathan already mentioned is, is that um, like one aspect of, of archiving a, a, a composer's work in, 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 in these years and, and with electronic or digital media is, is just, um, you know, preserving and uh, archiving the final mixes. So for example, in, in, in the uh, case of, of a composer, so the final mixes that are put say on a CD or on an album, uh, but then uh, there's also the archiving of, of, of you know, the whole composition process and, and say for someone like Phil, even now it's the mono recordings on, a, uh, uh, on digital, and 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 those are all uh, mono files, but then there's also the um, uh, Pro Tools project. Then there's uh, the, the different mixes, and and sometimes a, a piece has different mixes for different contexts. So this is all also like interesting challenges in, in relation to composition, for example. So. I think maybe that's enough for now and we can hear what other people have to say about all this. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Carol Parkinson. She is executive director of the Harvest Works, a digital media art center located in New York City. And since 1987, she focuses on the development of experimental artworks 
that explore sound, data, and other emerging technologies. Parkinson professional services included panel participation in the New York Foundation for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts, the National Endowments for the Arts. She is also executive producer in New York Electronic Art Festival, which consists of a series workshop, concert performances, and exhibitions centered around art and technology. So also she is a founding member of TELUS, the audio cassette magazine, which was published from 1982 to 19, 1996. And her educational background includes the University of Wisconsin Medicine, Skidmore College, Skidmore Co uh, College and the Whitney Museum Independent Study. Uh, Carol, can you please tell us about yourself, your research interest and programs and projects at the Harvest Works? Uh, Carol, please. Great, thanks. Thank you uh, for inviting me to present on this panel. It's so important, the preserving and archiving of sound art and experimental music. My presentation is about the history of Harvest Works, our collection of recorded works and our restoration, archiving and storage efforts. Oh, let's see, I gotta share my screen, right? Let's go here. Oh, here we go. Let's see. This is it. Okay, I think we're ready. Are we ready? Does everybody see that? Okay, cool. Okay, founded by artists. Oh, wait a minute, maybe I have to uh, put this in from here. Okay, founded by artists in 1977, Harvest Works is a nonprofit community art center, educating, commissioning, and producing contemporary work by composers, sound artists, visual, and multidisciplinary artists that today reach an ever-expanding and receptive audience. From our start as the public access synthesizer studio in the 70s, our neighborhood is quite different now, but our mission stays the same. We support artists in the creation of artworks achieved through the use of new and evolving technology and sound is still our passion. So our co this is our collection. This is a shot from our collection of recorded works, which span from 1982 to the present and consist of over 1800 items with even more to be logged into the database. Recordings include TELUS, the audio cassette magazine, studio compositions from our artists and residents and documentations from our presentations and workshops. This uh, slide of TELUS, the audio cassette magazine, it was, was published between 83 and 96 and includes 27 issues of 60 minutes each featuring experimental music, audio art, and spoken word on audio cassette and later on CD. With names like Lamont Young, Mike Gira, Lydia Lunch, Glenn Bronca, and Marisbau, the impression is of one of the most complete audio archives of that period. For our studio compositions from our residents, since 1982, we have sponsored 12 artists per year to create sound works specifically for the recording medium and in conjunction with other media. I like the comment by, by Morton Sabotnik, who has written the idea of writing of work especially for a recording, presents the composer with a rather fra a special frame of reference. It's not the reproduction of a work originally intended for the concert hall, rather it is intended to be experienced by individuals or small groups of people listening in intimate in surroundings, a kind of chamber music 20th century style. And uh, since uh, for our residency program, each of the residents leave a sample of the work produced in our studios and completed for our archive. Um, for the documentation from our presentations and workshops, uh, we have produced countless events by those residents and other innovative composers and sound artists from our community. We have also documented our workshops that have included programming and Max MSP and Jitter, algorithmic composition systems, synesthesia, 
hardware hacking and interactive performance system. HarvestWorks has documented basically a community, uh, um, a community is working in the transitional period between analog and digital through those years. And it's interesting sort of as an overview to see the work, to see their creative process as they have dealt with the technological changes. So our restoration efforts, what's driving us? Well, museums are cultural institutions that hold collections. They create currency with their acquisitions and their collections are ed an educational resource for significant cultural importance. For smaller organizations like HarvestWorks, our archive is our collection and accessibility as, as Jonathan was saying, accessibility is keyword and, and a great priority. So towards that goal, Harvest Works has received funds to remaster audio works from our artist in residence collection. The early works from 83 were recorded on analog audio tape and were remastered to a digital format. The successfully restored works were posted on our website in 2007. Unfortunately, at that time, we had chosen to use a content management system that proved to be cumbersome and quickly outdated. Consequently, the files were left behind because we lacked the funds to migrate the digital content to a new CMS. So since then, you know, our efforts have been sporadic. Interns have been recruited to digitize the media to hard drives. And although they're critical to our efforts, we are lacking the skills and the necessary funds for a professional outcome. Here is a photograph of Delia um, working away at our um, computer workstation with the cassette decks and uh, cassettes and uh, um, a labeler. And on the other side, you see the hard drives that are to be archived. So we just have a pile. Uh, so um, here is more as a photo, more photos of our archiving and storage efforts. You know, on the left, you have the archive wall, which is I think now 32 boxes worth of items, media items, plus um, papers and um, people and presentations. So. We, we, we've kept the papers along with the media to try to, to portray a complete, um, a complete uh, have a complete portrait of what the organization has been doing since, since the start. So our current physical media is tracked in the FileMaker database with the corresponding media stored in boxes. Our next step is to bring the archive up to date by incorporating our digital assets, which you saw on the hard drives, including several hard drives and data cartridges. There's been a lot of technical, technological changes, as um, Catherine has said, in computer peripherals since we started working in the digital environment in the 1990s. Physical tech connection technologies used to plug different input, output, and storage devices into a computer have changed dramatically over the years. And to, to wrap it up, because of these and other changes in the industry, preservation of our archive is an expensive challenge for us. I just wanted to, um, to close with what about sound art installations? Sound art works in space. How does one preserve sound art in the format, on the format of time-based installation? And I'm thinking maybe, I would like to throw that out, maybe it's similar to documenting and preserving choreography. And I'd like to look at, I think we should look at David Tudor's work, specifically Rainforest, to see if it could be a model. So David, David was on our board and David, you know, produced this schematic diagram that creates the basic electronic circuitry. Also there are photographs and teachings that have guided a small group of contemporary artists, notably the composers inside electronics, to preserve and expand on the rainforest instruments and performance. So here on the slide, you'll see that the, that you'll see the original circuit diagram. And then there's a photograph here of a realization of Rainforest 5 by composers inside electronics that, that HarvestWorks produced 
on Governor's Island in 2011. And then you see a more deluxe presentation of rainforest by the same group, Composers Inside of Electronics, at the, at the opening of the new Museum of Modern Art in 2019. So um, yes, so I guess that that's, that's, that's I, I'd like to put that out as just a possibility to how a, a, a model on how to preserve some of the uh, essential sound art installations that are being created today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And our next speaker is Sergei Komarov. He's a sound artist and a curator. In 2003 and 5, he curated the Isolation Works label, which published works by Russian experimental composers and musicians. And since 2008, he has worked as computer programmer and uh, um, an engineer at the Silent Media Art Lab. And since 2013, he curated SciFest, International Media Festival audio project, as well as silent, art, um, uh, silent uh, audio archives. Sergei is participant of many SciFests, as well as uh, uh, the Creative Machine 2 exhibition Goldsmiths University of London and exhibition in Pratt Institute and National Arts Club New York and Kafoska University in Venice and experimental intermedia as well. He lives and works in Kaluga in St. Petersburg. Uh, Sergey, can you tell us about yourself, your research interests and the Silent Media Art Lab project and the uh, programs? Uh, Sergey? Many thanks, Natalia. Uh, good afternoon, dear participants and viewers. Uh, it's a great honor and joy to meet uh, you and discuss sound art archiving. My name is Sergei Komarov, and I supervise the Silent Audio Archive, uh, as well as uh, Safest uh, Sound Art Program and Sound Art Related Projects in the Media Laboratory uh, in general. But today I uh, will focus uh, on the Silent Audio Archive as a project that is directly uh, related to the topic of the discussion. Uh, let me share my ecran, desktop. Do you see my screen? Great. Um, here is the um, uh, website with the Silent Audio Archive. Uh, for, uh, from the very uh, first iterations in 2007, Cyberfest has been interested in showing pure sound work along with the installations, objects, and other things which uh, also involve sound, but also have a bodily presence in the ex exhibition space. Uh, and this automatically created a precedent and a challenge for organizing the exhibition space for such shows with the mixed medias. Um, in those years, I worked in the media laboratory as an engineer and programmer and I uh, remember very well all those tests and flights of fancy, uh, the endless research and purchasing uh, players, tablets, headphones, directional speaker, a picture from the first festivals is a, a tiny iPod uh, gracefully attached to the walls with headphones uh, hanging in widely. Uh, with an annotation next to, to it that is uh, larger than the installation itself. Uh, and from year to year, with various deviations, experimenting with the demonstration of sound works, uh, mostly went this way. Uh, all festival materials were carefully uh, archived from the first festival by the Silent Sound Archive did not take shape as a department in, until 2013. Uh, by the way, an excellently structured video archive has been operating in the media laboratory since 2008. Um, but Anne Franz and Marina Kaldobska, uh, knowing my background as an experimental electronic musician, offered me to elaborate a sound program for the Cyberfest. 
And the place for my first sound uh, exposition was the cellar of Art Reflex Gallery at Cyberfest 9 uh, in uh, 2012. Uh, on the floor above, uh, Phil and Katerina were playing a deafening show and below in directional speakers designed in Media Laboratory. A playlist uh, was uh, quietly spinning. Uh, um, which made it possible to listen to specific um, uh, sound work and creating uh, one stochastic work. And uh, this accidentally uh, because of imperfection of directional speakers always present. Uh, and this uh, as accident uh, discovery of imperfection, we used a lot in the future and we call it later ether. Here you can see the amazed Berliner during the Cypress 10 in Berlin and the Bored Berliner and more excited Berliners also. Uh, after a very successful uh, start, Anna asked me to take care of the concept and the formation of the audio archive as we do with the uh, video artworks at the moment. Um, and this is no coincidence that at the time I was uh, actively interested in the issue of amateur recording and in general in the possibilities of getting some hardware suitable for the for this for recording. Um, so it was only natural that I choose this uh, medium later. The concept for the physical presentation of works uh, at exhibitions uh, in the form of uh, somewhat forgotten uh, records was born quite organically. I decided to follow um, the familiar system of record labels, uh, so I could get noticed by popular databases such as Discogs. Uh, I wanted to broaden the audience beyond the people interested in contemporary art and also reach music lovers interested in experimental music. So I found also Bandcamp to be a good platform for placing and listing into files. Uh, and the, at the exhibitions, uh, the format of record player along with the compilation of records also proved to be very successful involving the viewer in, in manipulating the records, uh, choosing the piece independently, a, a kind of quest and focusing attention on the object and then back on the sound. It, it definitely attracts more attention than just a player on the wall. So I really hope that this attention also creates a delayed interest. And uh, uh, I like the... Um, very poetic comparison of our records with frozen sounds. Thanks to the transparent records, uh, this find is also justified by the available material for cutting. Uh, we're using late cut technology, which means, which means we do not need to spend a lot of money on duplication, logistics, uh, and storage, the whole production process and package uh, concept is organized for small editions, which we primarily send to artists. And we also keep a small supply for the, our exhibitions. Mm. The very first cutting setup was based uh, around the uh, monophonic grumpy and cutter head that I uh, get. Uh, it was very popular in the 70s, this uh, cutting head. Uh, at the moment, this is uh, mostly a DIY setup with stereophonic cutter head and some parts from old American LEDs. Uh, this is some concept of descriptions, the very early ones. Uh, later, to some artworks, we added uh, postcards. Uh, so, um, here is the famous Grampian. For the um, 
sound quality uh, is improves every year, mainly thanks to the international community of people interested in direct recording on plastic, bypassing all the stage with the matrices, chemicals, other things such as press trackers do. Uh, this is fairly new discipline for which new technologies uh, of materials and sharpening cutters have developed uh, in recent years. I'm in touch with several people worldwide who also work on techniques and hardware improvements uh, in this rather very small segment of enthusiasts. And um, for a few words about archive content, the main statistical and analytical works still lies ahead. And then uh, when we archive, uh, when archive grows larger and we'll be able to catalog works according to various features. At the concept stage, I identified several texts such as experimental music and college uh, performances, programming and generative art, glitch, uh, data signification, field recordings, conceptual works, uh, sound of installations, and uh, of course, my beloved uh, found art. Mm, now we uh, process uh, past SciFest sci programs uh, and contacts, but for those uh, not only, uh, but of course, not only SciFest participants can join the archive, and one is welcome to submit artworks to us. And here's the only uh, one non late cut release at present is a double CD compilation released last autumn, uh, featuring recordings by Locked Down artists, which they uh, made uh, when the, all this COVID madness just only had started. Uh, so I won't dive into specific sound works to show, but I hope that I have uh, at least intrigued you to take a look or hear, uh, hear, hear, hear them at our repository on uh, Bandcamp. Uh, many thanks. Thank you, Sergey. Uh, Jonathan, you mentioned that New York Public Library is one of the world's largest sound archives. Uh, can you elaborate what are the main challenges for preserving sound works? how the archival and preservation process evolved in the past five years. And uh, what do you think, what you predict, what will happen in uh, five to 10 years, uh, Jonathan? Okay, well, um, thanks to all of you. It was, I learned a lot there um, and uh, wonderful. So, well, we we have had a we've made a large investment <clears throat> excuse me over the last few years to uh, do digital preservation of all of our audio and moving image objects. So this has been you know a multi million dollar project. We've ordered things by um, largely because it was a preservation project, largely by urgency. So we've gotten through nearly all of our mag magnetic media, so several hundred thousand tapes uh, and whatnot, optical media as well, so CDs uh, and those types of things. Um, now we're working more uh, aggressively on grooved media, so disc recordings, including cylinders and things of that nature. So the process of safely uh, digitizing. Uh, we also, I should say, we it's a combination because it's a mass project of using third party vendors, while as well as our in house engineer staff and our in house staff is more specialized uh, with particular, um, you know, skills with our our collections. So we we often keep the, the most uh, delicate, highest profile, maybe the rarest, and also the, the recordings of all sorts that require a fair amount of curatorial intervention so that we can communicate directly. So right now, institutions such as mine are very good at doing the fundamental and important uh, digital preservation of the, um, you know, of the audio or moving image. Um, and 
but what we what we need to develop going forward is um as carol so well quoted morton sabotnik like we're dealing with um a medium that's gone from yeah you know a, a description of something that happened to being a multi element archival object that has both you know the signal and what's recorded with the signal and then the object and has come up in nearly every discussion format has driven um not only great creative uh breakthroughs but it's also put a lot of us in very frightening positions because formats have the, the change of, of formats both audio moving image and now digital data um is moving much faster than anyone can really keep up with in a consistent universal way uh, and when it comes to these particular types of collections um we need to as a as a as a best practice um develop a set of practices that goes beyond the preservation of you know simply the content of the tape we we need to come up so it's not like it's out of question people do this we image things there are those who you know image tape as it goes by and and package that with the metadata and all that but it's expensive um it's uh you know it's resource intensive in terms of technology storage is 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 no joke um that's our largest expense in this endeavor so I think where I don't know where we will be, but I think what we'd like to do is be in a place where we have capture we've we've stabilized and conserved both the physical object to the extent we can, as well as what's on it. Um, when there's an opportunity, something as simple as multi track recordings, we have each track separately, you know, digitized so that we can at least try and estimate some uses in the future but i think taking care of the audio and moving image objects that um, are analog in nature and making sure that we're capturing all the important information of that physical art artifact whether it be in imaging where tape slices you know splices are um, information written on the containers information written on the leader tape all of these things need to be captured and it's expensive and time consuming and as much as we all you know love this area um it's it's not you know it's not in the top 40 most people so it's hard to get the generate the general interest in the public to make sure that we have um the resources to do this right so it seems to me more likely that it'll be a collaborative effort around the world to find different ways to get this right and hopefully people can stay in touch but in the meantime we all are pretty good i think at taking care of the physical materials and and we'll we'll start with that uh carol you mentioned that harvest works uh, is working closely with the emerging technologies what do you think the main concerns and development and challenges of emerging technology and preservation process well, it's the Wild West. I mean, you know, if, again, you know, you look at the, those works that possibly make it to a stable platform like the internet, semi-stable where at least there's the Wayback Machine or, or the archive, the great archiver of internet works. And, um, but, you, you know, in, in, a lot of the effort has to go is it has to go on to the artist also because you have you know first you have the artists and they're the ones that are really interested in keeping their work and some of them are and it's those artists that are really going to be able to carry forward so um so and, but but those artists need help also. So then they would come to an organization like Harvest Works to see what uh, resources that we may have to help them, you know, migrate their data to a, a new platform. Or okay, Flash is gone now. What do I do? Um, so it, again, I think uh, Jonathan's right. It's really going to have to be a community effort. 
but the reality is that we're not going to be able to save everything you know it's it's and and it's just and and, and you you would hate to think that it would be you you would you would like to think that it would be a curated saving of material but in reality in this environment that we are in it could be a technological failure so it's it's really as i said it's the wild west and i i would appreciate you know a professional group that actually wants to like get to the bottom of it and Catherine, as an intermediate artist, what are your thoughts on preservation process in uh, performative and video art where the sound is the major component? Uh, well, actually, I, I, I had a, an even more general thought about, about intermedia and media art in general. And um, I'm hearing uh, Carol and Jonathan speaking a lot about mi migration to different formats and things. And, but then um, there's also the question of technology. And, and for example, um, I know that the, um, the Rose Goldstein archive of new media art at Cornell, that they're also preserving um, where, for example, the experimental television archive is now, they're also pr preserving technology because, because um, according to them well but and especially some of the media work so like in in, in early um programming um multimedia works done in director um there they they they, they were developed for for specific technologies so it's in a way that the, the most faithful way to preserve them is to also preserve the technology. So I know that over there they they have a team that that actually fixes and 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 revives old technologies for certain pieces. I mean certain works. I, I luckily I think well again sound and music is is one thing because because a lot of it usually even, even I think nowadays composers even if if they're composing for an orchestra or for an ensemble they do have in mind that the, the, the composition is going to live on, uh, you know, in the form of, of, a, of an album, either on a CD or nowadays on an online album. But um, yeah, then when we get into um, audio and sound installation, uh, and, and, and the same with the moving image, I, th I think Carol's point is really interesting that to preserve the instructions and, and, and graphics about it, that, that's one thing. And I think certain things will, will just, you know, it, it's gonna be a mixture of whatever can be um, preserved or migrated or, or, or saved in some way and the description, you know, like, yeah, I, even I think of, of, of works like, I don't know, Michael Schumacher, who you've also had at Sciland, he does uh, multi-speaker work and he works with all sorts of different speakers. So that piece is not only the tracks for the multi-speakers, but it's the speakers themselves and which one he's chosen. And I've, I've seen recent performances of his multi-speaker work and he uses like, um, speakers from computers from the early 1990s and and uh just a mix of things and and that's what the piece is about so it's extremely complicated and i think that the technology itself is a great part of it and same with with visual media um something for example i've been working in video since the 80s um you know something that was created for um video monitors of the 1980s is just not the same on uh, you know current flat screen um, monitors it's 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 not the same I mean you know if it was conceived for those monitors it, it had that in my case anyway I had that in mind and it doesn't look the same with with the new monitors and same with projection etc so it, it's it's really complicated. <laughs> And um, yeah, and something I, I oh yeah, oh, never mind. I, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, at um, uh, one thing I know, speaking with Phil 
who was preparing to be part of this panel and couldn't join us, um, he was saying that in a way, the easiest archiving in terms of experimental intermedia is that, um, or the experimental intermedia archive is the easiest thing because it's just the recordings of concerts and their migration to um, more current media. But um, so we, we just preserve it as a recording and a video recording and, and if it was an installation, it's a video recording of the installation. So that's also a way I, I found for myself that some of the best ways of uh, recording and preserving, for example, a performance is a good documentation, a good video documentation of the performance or a good, good video documentation of an installation. That's kind of close. And, and if you can have a, a, a you know, multi-perspective one, well, that's even better. Uh, 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 Jonathan, Carol mentioned the relationship between the curator and the artist. What are your thoughts in the role of the curator in guiding and educating the artist, the public, through the preservation process? And also, what are advantages and challenges of preparing archives for the, for the public institution? And of course, like archiving like a life story. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, I'd say a few things. The first is, um, in this case, it's uh, working with um, not just artists, but institutions, ensembles, anyone, um, a gallery, these kinds of things. Um, I very much like to have almost this conversation to say, here's where we are at both you know my particular institution but i think generally um where we're at uh in terms of archiving this so just know that that there's a lot of open questions for how we're going to do this so at best you know let's just make sure that you um that we're prepared to at least you know preserve things in in the ways we know how right now so if that's digitizing if it's um you know, almost reverse digitizing, like Sari, I love the lathe cutter. And there's actually some things we've cut because uh, frankly, they're easier to get at and you can find them and they don't disappear when you move a hard drive or when you have a reorganization at your at your your local uh, electronic music shop or whatever. Like it's so I think just giving people a sense of the playing field, helping them understand what resources are available in terms of preserving and conserving the materials that you have. Um, reminding people how important, as Catherine said, things as, you know, video, photographs, very traditional ways of keeping track of things. And then we do our best um, moving forward to ex explore things. But I think the one thing about uh, working in a, a world that skews experimental, so to say, is that it defies traditional archiving um, and it's moving forward on purpose further ahead of most things. So there's some catching up, but I just try and work with people, let them know that there's it's there's people out there interested. Let's try and like keep track of what you have. We'll digitize it. We can keep things safe once it comes. Don't get over concerned about it at this point. And um, I think that's that's where we start and just trying to keep let empower people to know that there's not a single person out there that has all the answers about this. Carol and Sergey, I mean, we've been discussing that sound art and digital media is extremely hybrid. So what are your thoughts on kind of res on resounding the works and the new formats for the exhibition? I know Sergey mentioned quite a few. Carol, what are your thoughts on um, in, uh, like installation and exhibition uh, principles? Well, you know, Harvest Works is pretty much driven by our artists in residence program, which is um, a, a, an open call. We get 100 applications and in interdisciplinary work, new projects from artists all over the country in, in the United States. And then, you know, we convene our arts panel to decide which um, project should, should, should go forward. So, you know, we, uh, again, are very artist centric, you know, we just listen to the artist and okay, so we're involved in the production of the work. 
So over the course of the production process, new ideas might come up as, in terms of being able to present the works. Um, so we work closely with the artists to try and realize their, their vision, however, our limited resources can. And Sergey, and uh, how do you think you will move forward with the exhibiting sound art? and installations? Uh, we, uh, we have a lot of possibilities for experimentation. As you may see uh, on the pictures, uh, we even try to uh, print on the transparent record and uh, this, I mean notes, the descriptions, and uh, you can see it through the overhead projector. So from time to time, depending on where we in, uh, show in the archive and what equipment we may have, uh, we can we, we can uh, show the archive like a uh, site specific way. So it's, uh, but uh, 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 I like uh, the idea about the archives in kind of this of this kind, like the um, record labels that uh, you are using the people's resources to archive. This uh, this is of course works only uh, for the simple stereophonic recordings like we do, not the multi-track and digital media, but you can spread. Uh, you can use the people's people's resource and spread the records around the world and they will archive it with you uh, like you do when, uh, with Stellus. I'm a big fan of this label. So I'm also archiving your records <laughs> here. Thank you, Sergey. Sergey, and uh, probably the final question uh, for Jonathan. Uh, what do you think, what's the best resource for the people who want to dive deeper? Showing up to more of these types of panels. Uh, I do think that for, for those who want to um, understand best practices in preserving audio and moving image, there are two places that we rely on. One is the um, IASA standards, um, International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives, um, as well as the Audio Engineering Society. So those are places where you can get technical best practices for, for you know, things we're very all very good at doing now. Um, and beyond that, I do think reach out to the practitioners, reach out to folks like Carol, reach out to people like me so we can we can try and come up with it. But it it's going to be a combination of looking at existing practices and then trying to um, find people to help figure out the others. I think there's a lot of answers, but they're each people have come upon them themselves. So um, be patient, hopeful, but uh, always find somebody to talk to. Final thoughts. Oh, you know, I, just, I, I had a. Oh, oh, Carol? I just wanted to know what EASA, what was that? What were the, what's the acronym, uh, Jonathan? EASA, did you mention? Yeah, EASA is the International Association for Sound and Audio Visual Archives, I think. Okay. And okay, thank you. I just had a final thought about. Um, more emerging, uh, you know, sound art practices. And for example, um, a work I'm thinking of, Carol, that you know well, um, is a project, a project like, for example, Daphne Naftali's augmented uh, audio sound walk, which is is like it 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 plays sound uh, within Washington Square Park via. QR codes or or Carol, for example, in in the OLAP meetings, we were talking with Kat Mustatea, and there was those um, internet. Um, what what was it called? The Mozilla or the 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 thing? And and people were talking about um, creating directional sound in that. But when I look at that environment, I think that 
you know, a few years from now, it won't even be accessible. So like any thoughts on how these even more hybrid emerging technologies are gonna be preserved? Um, personally, um, it is just <clears throat> a challenge and I would recommend any of the artists who are working with Mozilla Hubs or any of those transitory um, online um, environments that the video and the audio recording is traditional video and audio recording is really going to be what is going to sh show what happened during that time. Yeah, I, I think so too. I, and I'm, I, I'm very satisfied by you uh, looking at video, audio and descriptions. It, it's still quite informative, for example, when, when you're doing research or something, so. Time is now up. Thank you so much, Don, uh, John Van Hyam, uh, Carol Parkinson, Catherine Liberovskaya, Sergei Komarov for sharing your thoughts on and perspective on safe and resound, uh, preserving uh, and archiving the sound art and experimental music, your passion and emphasis on sound art, the art practices bring us a step closer for it to be recognized movement and also embracing new waves in the 21st century. Thank you the audience. Thank you Silent Media Art Lab, Ground Salyanka Gallery, the Kaladzi Art Foundation team, and our translator, Irina Barskova, and of course, Leonardo Journal and the community for fostering the dialogue on art and technology. And let's continue our conversation, follow laser, Leonardo Art and Science Evening Rendezvous Talk St. Petersburg on social media. And thank you and have a good day. Thank, thank you for you. having us. Thank you.